It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 250 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday the 4th of December 2016. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Dr. Shane Joseph. Hello. And Penny Dumsday. Hello. And on the show today, we talk about the causes of Parkinson's disease. We could be looking in all the wrong places. But we may be a step closer to a diabetes treatment thanks to the venomous platypus. But first, for a long time now, vision problems have been a known side effect of spending a long time in space. We are now a big step closer to understanding why, thanks to some MRI scans done before and after trips to the International Space Station. Shane, what's going on? Mm, yeah, so apparently this was first identified um, in 2005 when an astronaut called John Phillips, who had perfect 2020 vision, which is one of the reasons he was chosen as an astronaut, because, you know, it's, <laughs> it's really good to have ex- excellent eyesight. After, being, mm. after spending six months in orbit, his vision deteriorated and they did scans and they, and they basically found that his eyeballs had been flattened, which essentially inflames the optic nerve and therefore permanently damaged his eyesight. And they didn't know how to... Okay. Like his entire eyeball wasn't flat. 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 It was just <laughs> the, the shape was squashed a bit to more, yes. so that the back of it was flat rather than rounded. Oh, I think, oh my God, that's horrific. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking like a two millimeter flat eyeball or something. <laughs> yeah, it was squashed flat so he could barely see. No, it's a bit like what happens with short sightedness. I think short sightedness is caused by a slight, um, it's like your eyeball is slightly flatter than normal. And therefore, the, when the light travels to your retina, it basically goes behind it. So you can't focus or something like that. It's, 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 a, it's a matter of where the light focuses on your retina. So if your eyeball changes shape, your vision is damaged basically. your retina changes shape as well so yeah 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 the focal point is moved that's right yeah, but, yeah. and I'm, I'm short-sighted so i should know this but <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway. well there are a number of different causes of short-sightedness but the one we're talking about here is a change in the shape of the retina yeah. so that the uh focal point is not where it should be yeah so obviously this is a problem because um and it doesn't happen in all astronauts apparently like you know if this isn't something that happens for everybody who's in long-term orbit but it obviously happens enough that it's a concern especially if we want to you know escape the bounds of Earth and colonise other planets until they develop artificial gravity, which is, you know, a staple in science fiction but is actually (laughs) very, very (laughs) difficult to accomplish, it's going to be a problem. So for a long time they thought it was basically vascular fluid like blood and lymph fluid travelling up to the brain from your legs and, you you know... Whoa. Which does happen. That sounds like a long way. (laughs) And that does happen, but apparently this was not... They they did some stuff. They did some experiments in um like the you know the vomit comet where they have like they, they simulate weightlessness mm. on Earth and they actually and they did scans and they found that actually intracranial pressure drops during p- periods of zero gravity. So that wasn't so the vascular fluid going up you know from your legs to your head isn't the reason for it. Um, but what they did find was when they did some MRIs, they they noticed on so they they, they compared astronauts who'd been um in, on long term flights and those who'd been on short term flights in orbit and they discovered that it's actually cerebrospinal fluid which is basically the the the, the colorless fluid that surrounds your brain and your the top of your spinal cord it essentially cushions your brain from things like rapid movement um it's you know it's just it's a nice little sort of buffer but apparently in microgravity it gets confused about where to go and therefore it presses onto the backs of eyeballs and they found that people they found that astronauts who'd spent more time in in orbit actually had more cerebrospinal fluid behind their in their like their skull cavities, and that's what's causing oh. that's what's causing the eye the, the eyeball to be flattened slightly, and that's what's causing the pressure on the optic nerve, and therefore the vision loss. So we have a reason for it. Wow. That's great. Um, now, how do you? <laughs> <laughs> and to be honest, there's it's really hard to. I, I don't like you know you can do a lot of things to stop the effects of gravity on a on an astronaut's body, like you know. I think they exercise for something like seven to eight hours a day kind of thing, or maybe I'm just making that up, but it's a long mm. time. So they, you try to keep yourselves in optimal condition, but you can't stop where fluid goes in your body, in microgravity. Mm. So how are they going to counter this? I have no idea, and they probably don't. And, and if they if they can 
develop a way that the vision loss would be reversible, that would be okay, but it currently isn't. So you have guys guys and women going up there um, with perfect 2020 vision and coming back having to wear reading glasses. So that's not ideal. Um, and, no. And obviously this has real implications for, as I said, long-term space travel because you know, this is a six-month orbit or, you know, going around this, in the space station around Earth. Can you, can you imagine how long it would take to go to, like, to mm. say, Mars and mm. how much your high stock mm. deteriorate in that, in that time? So, yeah, it's... it's yeah. Yeah. But like I say, it's great that we now know how it happens. That's still very that cool. That being said, it's not peer-reviewed yet. Like, this is a very small sample size. I think they have to do a, a lot more study to actually confirm that this is exactly what's causing it. This appears to be what's causing it on the small sample size they've looked at. They haven't published this yet, so it's, you know, it's hit the news waves because, you know, that's what it does. But it looks like it's probably the reason. And, yeah, it doesn't really bode well for long-term space travel. No, it doesn't, unless we... Somehow but develop, the, as you say, artificial gravity. Go, Ben. I was going to say, if someone said, look, do long-term space travel and we'll send a doctor to do laser eye surgery or something at the end, I'd be like, yeah, mm-hmm. that's a fair payoff, you know? Yeah, that's oh, true. It, yeah. Like, it is. I think there'd be people, but yeah, I know, I get what you're saying. <laughs> it's also, it's an added risk because yeah, there's yeah. still risk anytime you do surgery, anytime you yeah, yeah. go into space, there's more risk, but you know. For a lot of people, that's a risk they're willing to take, and it's in the name of science. So we learn more things the more people we send up there. So it's and I'm fairly sure cool. that if you'd ask any of the, any of these long term astronauts, do you regret your time on the space mm-hmm. station, even though you came back with no paired vision, they would say, "No, of course I don't, you fool! <laughs> don't be silly." <laughs> so you know, yeah. but, it, but you it can is, still wear glasses as well. So, <laughs> yeah. but it is obviously a problem if you're going, if you're going to talk about long term travel to other mm-hmm. planets. For example. And long-term living on other planets, because it's not necessarily a microgravity. It could also just be the lower gravity on Mars or the moon, for example, could uh, mm, also yeah, cause this. So long-term colonization, we'll have to deal with yeah. this. Artificial gravity, oh, yeah. let's start working on it. <laughs> All right. Yes, we, we uh, want to start, damn it. We want to, we want to be able to walk around ship, you know, floating everywhere, definitely. Anyway. Well, especially because, um, you know, when we read these articles, you always – click on some of the links that go to a, a slightly related story. And one of the ones in this uh, linked to a problem that I had in 2010 where they found that a lot of astronauts were having their fingernails ripped off by the gloves that they wear. Uh, so when they're going outside the station or whatever to do uh, uh, to fix something and they have to use gloves, they have to use this fine motor control in a pressurised glove and the fingernails are just scraping against the material all the time and some people are having it ripped off, which is not a huge problem except it catches on the material of the gloves and it can get infected and things. So they're now having to tape their nails down before they put them into the gloves and things like that. It's There's a lot of physical problems that come with going into space, but yeah, you know, yeah. we can work around them hopefully most yeah, of the time. Definitely. So speaking of weird things, the duck-billed platypus is weird. It's one of only two mammals that lay eggs, and it's also one of few venomous mammals. The male has a spur on its leg that injects a venom that's quite painful to humans especially. But it's that venom that has some scientists excited. Penny, it contains a hormone that promotes insulin release, which could be really useful in treating diabetes, for example. Yeah, so... I mean, just to do the brief 101 recap on diabetes, it's mm. a failure to produce this hormone insulin or, you know, insufficient insulin. Insulin, And insulin causes your blood sugar to fall after you've eaten food. So, And there's it's it's got a hormone, a complementary hormone called glucagon, which causes your blood sugar to rise. But because it's so easy to get your blood sugar to rise by eating sugar, basically, Mm. there's not been a lot of worry about glucagon. It's getting insulin to be um, released that is a problem. So platypuses have this hormone which is called glucagon-like peptide 1, which I'm going to call GLP-1, and which is, (laughs) as everyone else does, because I'm not saying glucagon-like peptide 1 too many times. (laughs) (laughs) Um. And what this does is it stimulates the release of insulin. So these hormones also detect, you know, levels of everything. So if there's too much glucagon, insulin goes up and so on. So it's a hormone that's a bit like glucagon and it gets insulin to be released. Now, in most mammals, it's destroyed really, really quickly, which is 
good for someone with a normal functioning metabolism, but not so good for someone diabetic who really wants his hormone to stick around and get more insulin to be released. Mm -hmm. However, in monotremes, so platypuses and echidna, which are the, um, the only mammals which lay eggs, it functions a bit differently. And this hormone is used not just for glucose regulation, but it's also used for venom. So essentially, a molecule that every other animal or most other mammals use to control insulin release has evolved to become venomous. And because a venom has different requirements to a um, blood sugar regulation hormone, in platypuses it's actually been modified to last longer, which might make it be suitable for treating diabetes. Because one of the reasons it's not so useful to treat diabetes, this wouldn't it be great to have a hormone that could get the body to release its own insulin, is that Mm. it just degrades, it breaks down. But platypus venom, and it seems that when, if you, I've never been bitten or not bitten, what's the word? Stung? Um, Venomized. (laughs) Venomized by platypus. I hope I never do because apparently it is incredibly, incredibly painful. But this um, glucagon-like hormone, peptide, Sorry, GLP-1. I said I wasn't going to say it again. Um, why did you I lie keep to us, myself? Penny? Oh, I lied to myself. Um, <laughs> will cause blood sugar to drop, it, which doesn't make anyone feel good. And yeah. so, as and the, all the other things in the venom cause intense pain. So that was a bit of a tangent from my point that it's it's long lasting. And so, I think this could be really, really useful if. They can discover like how it lasts longer and to produce sort of some kind of slow release drug that could help uh, diabetics regulate their insulin levels. I think that would be Mm. fantastic because diabetes, I think, has become almost normalized now. Like, oh, you know, people can just take insulin and it's all fine. But it's not, you know. It's actually can be really, really difficult and quite hard. So, yeah. We should caution, of course, that you still need a lot more research, and this is a long oh, yeah, way from a pill or anything. Uh, presumably, oh, yes. Sorry, yeah. It, it's still a good idea maybe to keep a pet platypus as an emergency if you're diabetic and you need a quick uh, bite from a – no, not a bite. Anyway, let's just move on because that was a terrible joke. <laughs> I said the image of a guy holding a you know diabetic <laughs> platypus in the tank going, Oh my god, it's getting low. Wait, let's let's get out and get take the platypus. <laughs> <laughs> but only in the mating season. Oh yeah. yeah. Right. So you've got to keep it basically on heat for the on heat. Right. Oh, awesome. horny platypus. And only I, a I, male, obviously. I know yeah. nothing about the um the menstrual cycle or otherwise of a platypus. <laughs> yeah. Well it doesn't matter because it'd have to be a male platypus. Oh, okay, sorry. They're the only ones that have the spur that inject. So. Oh, really? Is it a um, Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Which is odd. I would have thought Wait, do, do, the females would want to protect themselves as well. But I thought, so yeah. don't have the males, aren't the males the ones who look after the eggs? Platypus? I don't know. You I could don't be right. think so. I okay, don't, I I don't thought, know. So maybe I'm wrong. Any platypus? Where's a platypus specialist when you need one? I hope, I hope someone <laughs> sends us an email like, seriously, Please you guys, do. why are you even talking about platypuses? You know nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, that could be said for everything we talk about, <laughs> but we do our best. Um, so, shall we move on to Parkinson's disease? Another thing we know nothing about, <laughs> but the underlying cause could be more of a gut issue than a brain issue, according to a, a study by researchers at Caltech, which suggests it could be related to deposits of these insoluble fibres that are possibly caused causing an irritation in the gut or caused by an irritation in the gut. Is that right, Shane? Yeah. Again, it's uh, one of these studies that's been done on mice. So um, even the researchers caution, look, this might not be directly applicable. Mm-hmm. But what they have noticed in these um, – so they, they, there's a mouse model for Parkinson's disease, which is basically um, it. the mice express a, an excess of this same um, alpha cytonuclein, which is – um, implicit in Parkinson's disease, which, but yeah, basically deposits of it, the uh, build up of it cause um, the tremors that you get in Parkinson's disease. Now, they did some interesting work on this. They they took these mice, um, these ones that develop Parkinson's like disease. When you raise when you raise them under sterile conditions, less of the protein was produced. 
and the mice don't have as many tremors. They perform much better in physical tasks. Um, when you then treat, you, you raise these. So mice. when you say a sterile environment, you mean the actual mice themselves have like no gut bacteria? Is yeah. that what you're talking about? Exactly. Yeah. So okay. they've basically cool. irradiated. I'm guessing they would have irradiated them and then brought them up in a um, raised them in like a, a germ-free environment. Yep. Okay. So. In another set of experiments, they basically treat them with antibiotics and you get a similar result. So you kill off their gut, well, antibiotics that specifically target gut microorganisms. I'm not sure which ones. I'm not even sure if it was just like a, um, you know, a targeted one. Broad specific. spectrum. One's yeah. all, it's, I'm guessing probably broad spectrum, but I could be wrong. But this has a similar effect as, as when you raise them in a sterile environment. You basically have fewer Parkinson's-like um, symptoms, disorders. So... Then they actually, I think they then transplanted, yeah, that's what, they, they transplanted gut microbes from people, humans with Parkinson's into these, into healthy mice and saw the same. Ooh. Okay. Yeah. So basically, it's, there seems to be a causal link here between gut microbes and the onset oh, of Parkinson's. Oh. Um, yeah. And, and I think, what, what, I think this was just a while ago where um, they noticed in autopsies of people who'd had, um, and biopsies of people who'd had Parkinson's, they discovered that this cyanuclein was actually in the gut as, as well as in the brain. So it's, hmm. it seems to be, it could be like a microbially produced or a or, or triggered protein. So it's, again, one of these studies but, which shows that there might be some sort of link between the ever present gut or, or the gut microbia and your health. But I think also they were saying it's not so much that the bacteria itself is producing this synuclein, these fibres, but they are triggering inflammation and it's an inflammation that causes the build-up. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's what they're speculating at least because otherwise you, presumably you would be able to isolate the particular yeah, I guess uh, so. toxin that was causing it. But uh, yeah. So it's some sort of gut ir irrit inflammation or irritation that's causing it. So. Yeah, yeah. So Very interesting. So that, I mean, we've been looking, obviously we're doing brain scans. We've been focusing on the brain because that's where the symptoms seem to be manifesting. But it's one of these problems where the, the answer may be lie elsewhere, in this case, the gut. That's very cool. Again, in your gut, yeah. Which, I mean, I remember, wasn't it last year when we were basically, every single story we were talking about, every single story, <laughs> about the it's gut. the and gut this, microbiome. And it, it does come back to this. I mean, the gut, you know, we, we know that the gut micro, uh, microbiota are extremely important, but we don't know, we, we typically don't know how important in terms of, you know, what, what exactly the, you know, they mm. do um, and what they cause. And, but every single study that seems to come up and show that there is a link between <laughs> something a disease or something like that and this, yeah it, it seems to be fairly prevalent but but also we do know that there's a strong link between the stomach and the brain in a number of things from uh your moods can often be influenced by your gut and the bacteria in that also some of the things one of the things they found with the parkinson's thing is that when they in people that have had the main nerve to their stomach cut which used to be a treatment for stomach ulcers they have a lower risk of parkinson's so it's definitely a nerve, stomach, brain thing. Well, it's not definitely, but it's strongly indicated to be a nerve, gut, brain thing. So it's still very cool. We can maybe one day find the particular bacteria that cause it and wipe them out. Yeah. Who knows? Or let them get resistant to all our treatments. Of Anyway, no, it's another story. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's our show. Uh, of course, you can get more information at scienceontop.com slash 250. And there you can find all the ways to get in touch with us and all our social media links. Don't forget to leave a review for us on iTunes and help us get the word out. Thanks for joining us today, Penny and Shane. Always a pleasure. No worries. Thank you. This episode was edited with an air of impending doom by Marcos Benamou. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. And so chronic illness, particularly that first six months, made me, I always joke that the word patient is, is uh, very carefully chosen because what you need is patience. But it's also understanding that if, you, uh, if you're going to survive these things, you have to sort of do what you're told. It, it, you've got to trust the doctor. You've got to respect the doctors. And I've been through the hands of a, a lot of very, very experienced specialist doctors obviously renal physicians and rheumatologists and all of those people i really despise 
anti-vaccination people and alternative medicine people who and i still get it you know you you should really try i've got a i've got an immune system disease which means my system goes crazy the immune system goes crazy and uh, it's remarkable how many people tell me that i need such and such a herb or drug or uh, uh, alternative medicine whatever because it will boost my immune system i don't need it to boost it that's the problem you know? <laughs> actually they need a little bit of your immune system yeah in like one tenth of that in I'll a jug of water a and we'll start our own little <laughs> business on the side yeah. i think yeah 